once again, if you want to equate the word invasion, which, by the way, is the single most appropriate word which differentiates benign from malignant tumors, if you want to further break down that word invasion into loosening, attachment, degradation, and migration, you certainly can, because the loosening occurs when there is breakdown of the cadherins, which keep the normal cells stuck to each other. We have known for a long, long time that cancer cells lose their stickiness or their normal adhesion to each other. In the second phase, the uh, factors which normally attach cells to a basement membrane, the laminins, the fibronectins, they get attached even stronger. And it's probably not surprising that when the cells then break through this basement membrane, uh, one of the ways they do it is to uh, code for collagenase, which breaks down the collagen, perhaps the type 4 collagen of the basement membrane, or the further collagen underneath the basement membrane. But these are all uh, steps of the process that we call invasion. And it's probably not surprising that uh, experimentally invasive cells have more collagenase than non-invasive cells. That's certainly something you would believe, and you can because it's true. The concept of metastasis is, uh, in a way, part of the extension of invasion because, really, when you think about it, metastasis is really invasion into a, a blood vessel or a lymph vessel, isn't it? But then there's the process of extravasation, just like we had intravasation, the invasion into the vessel. We now have to come out again. Needless to say, I'll just uh, keep it at the fact that there are several genes proto-oncogenes, which when they are mutated, they are, onco they are oncogenes. So mutations of these proto-oncogenes to be NM23, KAI-1, KISS, are all uh, genes which have been indicted in the metastatic uh, process. Well, we can move up a little bit now from the gene into the chromosome, because uh, you know they're all part of the same process. So it is a well-known fact that in the vast majority of hematologic malignancies, in other words, leukemias and lymphomas, there is usually some type of predictable uh, either translocation or inversion present on the chromosomes of the tumor cells. The concept of a translocation is to take one part of a chromosome and just switch it around with another. This almost always occurs in the uh, Q, or the larger part of the chromosome, chromosome, rather than the smaller P part. And that's probably because there's more room for it to do it. The concept of uh, an inversion is strictly to take a segment of a chromosome, also usually on the longer or P segment, I'm sorry, the Q segment, and just switch it around. So. Uh, in almost all the leukemias and lymphomas, there's some types of either transloc, much more likely to be a translocation than an inversion, but also in a big growing number of non-hematologic cancers as well, as well as sarcomas. And um, also remember in the process of translocation or inversion, this is probably also going to uh, easily result in specific genome mutations as well, isn't it? So if you want to remember uh, kind of a list we said already most of the leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, here's one that is a Ewing's sarcoma, which is a sarcoma. It occurs in a bone, and it is it looks a lot like these small-celled uh, hematologic malignancies. But in every case, we have a translocation from one Q segment of a chromosome to another. And if you want to memorize which one, go right ahead. But I've never been able to do it in my life. As a result, uh, here are some specific genes that would be mutated, or in other words, become oncogenes uh, because of it. But I just want you to remember the pattern here. Uh, most, if not all, of the chronic 
myelogenous leukemias. This is the Philadelphia chromosome. This is the granddaddy of all the uh, translocations for malignancy. Uh, many or most of the acute leukemias, AMLs, ALLs, Burkitt's lymphomas, mantle cell lymphomas, follicular lymphomas, T cell lymphomas, B cell lymphomas. These are all uh, malignancies in which there is a common, often predictable uh, translocation occurring. But remember, even the Philadelphia chromosome here is not present in all of chronic myelogenous leukemias. It's probably like about 95%, but it's not all of them. Carcinogenesis is a multi-step process, and we talked about a wide variety of genes uh, mutating into oncogenes, and as a result, growth processes uh, went uh, unregulated, uh, adding to the development of uh, tumor cells. But there is not one single oncogene which causes cancer. So, you, you know, you could take a, a horrible mutation of any of the ones we just talked about. If that was the only one present, it's not enough to cause cancer. Uh, so, in actuality, you probably need at least a couple of oncogenes and a couple of tumor suppressor genes must be involved before you can really get a development of a tumor. Uh, you might also kind of remember the gatekeeper slash caretaker concept. The gatekeepers <coughs> are genes and ultimately their products, which are a result in the process of tumors developing, so oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes. Now, caretakers are uh, genes which are involved in DNA repair. So here you have genes which are letting in the cancer, and here are genes which are involved in uh, checking things to make sure cancer doesn't develop. So. If you want to think of that as a dual concept, you certainly can. And I want you to remember that the word progression is a very, very specific definition as well. It's basically the behavior of a cancer cell once it becomes cancer. Before it becomes cancer, it's called transformation. What it does and how it behaves and where it goes and the damages that it does, the, uh, the burden that it causes, the symptoms, uh, is progression after it has transformed. And some of those are uh, due to things we've talked about, uh, angiogenesis, and related to the fact that once the tumor cell has uh, become a tumor cell, and it's progressing now through these various steps, it can also mutate, can't it? It can express a wide variety of cell types. It could become apoptotic, it could differentiate, or it could keep on multiplying if it's part of that replicative pool. So once that tumor progresses, it has a great amount of heterogeneity, doesn't it? Okay, let's introduce another concept, and we had been be beating around the bush with it, but let's actually uh, introduce it now because it's a, it's a huge, important concept. The concept of initiation and promotion, and I hope I do it justice. We have been talking about processes which cause tumors, okay? We've been talking about indirectly carcinogenesis and the processes, the proteins, the mutations which uh, cause these uh, tumor cells are called initiators. So if you want to equate initiator as, a sp uh, as being almost synonymous with a carcinogen uh, thing, you certainly can. Own initiators by themselves can't cause cancer. They can only cause mutations. In order for cancer to progress, to uh, develop and grow, you have to have another compounds, another class of compounds called promoters. So both initiation and promotion are necessary for carcinogenesis. And uh, initiators cause the mutations. Promoters do not cause mutations. They cause increased growth after the malignant cells are present. And uh, promoters are specifically there to enhance the proliferation of the cells which were already initiated. Uh, this, I hope, is not a difficult concept, but we've always known forever, before we knew anything about these molecules, is that 
it's not just a carcinogen that causes cancer. It's a carcinogen and something that keeps the cell uh, uh, proliferating. Thank you very much for now.